Hi everyone, I'm Corey Alderdice, Director of the Arkansas School for Mathematics, Sciences, and the Arts, and welcome to Part 3, College Admissions, Finding a Narrative, Choosing a Path. As we complete this discussion for high school juniors beginning to think about college admissions, scholarships, and all the process that goes into the selections behind the scenes, I want to conclude this series with some general tips and tricks and things to be mindful about, as well as point you to some additional resources as you continue your exploration. Uh, in part one, we looked at a changing landscape, as well as the topics that are on students' and parents' minds as they begin the process. In part two, we explored all the things that go into creating a strong and competitive narrative for selection. And now let's see other things to keep in mind. I did mention this briefly in part one, but I think it's important to return to it here. If you're planning to apply to a selective institution, so an Ivy, a research institution, and even in some cases just a lot of uh, independent colleges or, or particular departments or programs, um, keep in mind if you need to take uh, any SAT subject test. That's not something a lot of students do and at times that will sneak up on you when you're working on uh, November deadlines and, and might even miss the boat as a result of it. So as you really begin to jump into building your list, do pay attention to if you should or if it's valuable to uh, take some SAT subject exams. The second thing is the importance of the campus tour as an opportunity to connect with people and to determine personal fit. Most colleges now in their admissions offices use a, a CMS, a, a customer management system or CRM, customer relationship management system. And so they're tracking the, the number of times that they communicate with you as well as the times and ways in which you communicate and interact with them. Uh, what CRMs help folks understand is the level of interest and enthusiasm you happen to have for an institution, and often one of the best ways to demonstrate that is to engage with that institution in person through a campus visit. Uh, why is a campus visit so important? Um, more than anything else, it's to figure out, is this the place you actually want to spend the next four years of your life? Um, are these the people you want to spend the next four years of your life? And, and while first impressions are not always the most accurate things, getting a sense of the community, of the campus, the physical space will tell you a lot about an institution, the kind of experience that they provide, uh, and a host of other things. We had a, a student who graduated a few years ago that, that visited uh, a really great college and was very interested in the department and in program and the department chair spent 30 minutes trying to to tell this student why uh, a specific subset of computer science really isn't what they should be studying. They, they ought to be studying this in general. And, and to just kind of see how quickly that school went from number one on that young person's list to the very bottom basement, like that. Uh, so again, you can learn a lot by visiting now. Recognize that not every student will have that ability to do so due to financial limitations. So there are lots of other ways, uh, whether it's attending online webinars, um, you know, replying for more information, even communicating by phone or email with your state admissions officer. Uh, that's a great way to, to build out that relationship because you have to remember there are actual real live other people on the other side of these conversations and more often than not those are the people who will be sitting around the table making decisions advocating for you and your selection. So do work to authentically build relationships. Uh, students will often get uh, what we kind of call these uh, cattle call uh, letters, information sessions, where it'll be six or, or seven top institutions, things like Harvard, Duke, Chicago, Dartmouth, uh, you name it. Uh, those are helpful. They can be good introductions and they can be an opportunity to um, ask questions about a particular institution. Um, 
those I think have, have nominal impact beyond just showing up in the, the customer relationship system uh, because more often than not that is a dedicated team of admissions professionals that go city to city conducting those sessions. So even though they may be in Little Rock to do a session, they are not necessarily the person who will be making decisions about applicants from Arkansas and this region. So keep that in mind. And again, personal touches matter. Any person you interact with, especially if it is a physical interaction, if they come here and participate in ASMSA's college fair, or they come here and do a session on campus, send a thank you note. Uh, small touches matter. Genuine gratitude matters. And the more you work to do that authentically, the better off you will be. Do not search out your admissions officer's birth date or other milestone dates and send them candy, flowers, or a cake that's weird that has happened to admissions officers before. Not the best way to go about it. A simple note, simple email, that's all it takes. So a couple things to keep in mind. Social media. Uh, as we saw a spike in, in social media platforms and users uh, over the last decade, uh, much hand-wringing was made about whether or not uh, students should clean up their social media profile and even what does that look like. In some cases, you have folks that have a personal, real Instagram account and then a more professional, public-facing Instagram account. Rule of thumb I offer is this, if you feel like it's a concern and you have to clean it up, then you know what, um, you probably shouldn't be posting it in the first place. Uh, a, a social media presence is also particularly important for um, student athletes, that's not quite as germane to our conversation and our type of ASMSA students. But I do think one social network that there is considerable value in, in getting out there on is LinkedIn. Yep, seriously, LinkedIn. A uh, couple reasons why. Uh, it is a traditional professional profile. It's pretty straightforward and simple. It's not one where you're going to be posting a tremendous amount of content. But here's what LinkedIn does for you, is it does help you to establish an online presence that will help you both now and in the future. Two, it helps you to build out a professional network. These are probably not the people that are interested in hearing what you had for lunch or where you're traveling to, but they are potential connections that will help you as you start looking for internship, research, or actual job opportunities, even in the future. Other thing that's also interesting about LinkedIn is it does rank fairly high on Google's search algorithm. So um, if you search a particular person's name, and, and especially if you know their geographic location, more often than not, LinkedIn is going to be one of the first things that shows up on page one of search results. So there's a lot of utility in it in just helping to establish an online presence, especially if you're not the type that you want to go out and build a yourname.com website. Um, third, be mindful of what you say related to admissions processes, campus tours, etc. Um, again, social media becomes a little more important if you are in consideration for top scholarship or fellowship programs. Um, so maybe don't go to a fellowship interview and talk about how bad the food was or, or how terrible the campus was or the weather was. Little things like that keep in mind. I, I think it's the old adage of if you don't have something nice to say, don't say it at all. Uh, and then realize that big data can be working uh, behind the scenes. There are some institutions that do use uh, machine learning uh, and, and language algorithms that, that do this automatically. It's not as though there's someone individually <laughs> clicking on the screen behind the scenes. Um, so again, if you don't have something nice to say or encouraging, don't say it at all. Probably also not a good thing to publicly list your top institutions as well. This is my second favorite exercise to, to do with students in this conversation, and, and it does serve to highlight an important lesson. Uh, this is a real live human being <laughs> that I worked with uh, at, at a school in another state, uh, and probably one of the most extraordinary students and young people I, I've really had the chance to work with in, in about two decades of, of working with and mentoring gifted and talented students. So, how do you stack up relative to this person. Uh, she had a 36 ACT score, perfect, like genuine 36 ACT, 36, 36, 36, 36, none of this half 
35.5 kind of score. She was a U.S. Presidential Scholar, an actual selectee for the Presidential Scholars Program, one from two of the state. Uh, she spent six weeks in the summer through Nestle, the National Security Language Initiative for Youth, and actually she was involved in the, the Advanced Chinese Language Program, so she was effectively doing two college-level language courses in one semester on an accelerated timeline. Uh, during the summer, she did research at Cornell. Uh, this is a competition that no longer exists, but she was a DuPont essay national honorable mention, so one of the top 40 young writers in this essay contest. Uh, a wonderful performer, played the flute uh, for several years and was involved in the local youth orchestra. She was actually a black belt in Taekwondo as well too. Uh, an Intel Science Talent Search semifinalist. This is now the Regeneron Science Talent Search where ASMSA has had uh, students selected in the last couple of years. And she was plugged into uh, research on the college campus uh, and being mentored by a university faculty member. So, how do you stack up? Feeling a little inadequate, maybe? I feel inadequate <laughs> when, when thinking about uh, how, how awesome and a rock star uh, this student is and was. Um, so, the question is, where did she go to college? Second question is, did she get into Harvard? Now, by asking the question, that maybe gives you a little hint of the answer. Uh, no, she did not get into Harvard. Got into several other Ivy League institutions, but Harvard said, no thank you. And I offer this example for a couple of very important reasons. One, and probably most important, it tells you that you can do everything. You can literally stack up and be a once in a generation kind of student. And even then, things may not work out the way that you want it to. You can have perfect scores. You can be involved in a variety of academic activities. Um, you can win so many awards and still the answer may be no. And that's why it's so, so, so important not to wrap up your sense of identity in the outcome of this process. Second, where did she wind up going to school? She went to the regional uh, or what we call comprehensive uh, state school, not the, the land grant, not the flagship, but the place where uh, the school um, similar to ASMSA was located. And here's why. Um, First, the university president recruited her in, in a, a way that I only had seen him do so for seven-foot basketball centers or for 400-pound linemen uh, for the football team. I mean, they actively recruited um, the student, and that helps. Uh, but more important was the ways that she had plugged into the institution and saw the people who had invested in her. I note that, that she did a summer research program at Cornell. She saw her research mentor at Cornell all of twice over a, a month-long experience. Um, on the first day when he introduced himself, and on the last day when he thanked her for, for participating in the experience. Otherwise, she interacted with grad students. By comparison, the university faculty member on the campus where the school was had deeply committed to her support and success. That's one of the reasons that she, she actually got the Cornell opportunity in the first place, and it's definitely the reason that she was selected for the Science Talent Search as a, as a national semi-finalist. Uh, again, she had found a, a great connection and program with the Chinese Language Flagship Program as well, and had really built some connections with both students and faculty uh, that were of interest to, to her. And so she ultimately had found a sense of belonging and a place she wanted to be. Now also, they offered her a full kid and caboodle top scholarship fellowship package so that that helps as well but more so than the money it was about both the sense of place and the people who had invested in her and would continue to invest in her most students will not get into harvard most students will not get into an ivy or a you know exclusive research institution and that's okay 
that's okay. When prospective uh, families for ASMSA ask what's our IV acceptance rate, what's the percentage of students uh, that, that go on to an Ivy League school, I say that's not a number that we track. Honestly, that's not a number that we care about because what that question means when it's asked is, will this school help you get into Harvard? And the answer is no, for a couple of reasons. One, we can't make that guarantee. We cannot promise an outcome because that is out of our hands. It's out of your hands, too. Um, and, and the second part is where you go to college is not who you are and it's not who you'll be. And if you think of this experience as a means to an end, then again, you're missing the point. This process, all of this is about your growth as an individual, investing in your interest and setting you for the next stage. Is it possible to get into Harvard? Absolutely. A few thousand people do it every year. Um, some through you know straightforward ways, others through through legacy or athletics or, or a variety of other pathways. Uh, but it is possible. But again, look at this example here. You can do everything that might be expected of a student, and still, even then, it may not be enough. And that's okay. So you can do everything, but here are some things you specifically don't want to do. Uh, do not wait until the last 10 minutes before the deadline to submit the application. Do not run it down to the wire. Be on top of things. Go ahead and get it done for your own peace of mind and also to make sure everything has been completed, submitted, and received well in advance of deadlines. Second thing as we turn the corner from spring to summer, don't plan to spend your entire summer on Netflix. Look for something productive to do, whether it's a research opportunity, an internship experience, even one of the fellowship programs that, that the ASMSA Foundation offers to students to help keep them engaged in the summer. Find a job, volunteer, do something important. Take time to relax. That's great. That is essential. But also do something that is going to keep you engaged and plugged in. Also, don't put the wrong university name on your essay. That happens surprisingly often, especially as uh, drafts are edited and as essays and responses are reused from program to program and institution to institution. Don't list more extracurriculars than there are in hours in the week. Remember, we're looking for quality, not quantity. Fifth, do a little basic research. Don't say you want to attend a particular college because of a specific program and they don't even offer that as a major. Make sure that the institutions you are applying to align to your actual personal real interests. And six, and it's probably an appropriate place to, to end this idea on, is do not think that a great ACT will make up for a low GPA. You don't have to have a 4.0 GPA. That's okay. You don't have to be perfect on paper. Uh, but again, all things in balance, particularly students who are in national merit range. Um, a B is okay. Sometimes two Bs are okay. A C is probably where you get omitted from the list. Um, a student I know who was selected as a U.S. presidential scholar, different one from the previous example though, um, got a B on their fall courses. Um, at, thought it was the end of the world. Thought all the opportunities, all the decisions were over and still with that B on their transcript were still selected as one of two representatives from the state for the U.S. presidential scholars program. You don't have to be perfect but you need to consistently give your best. Not be the best, but do your best. Some additional notes on recommendations as you work with faculty members. Again, the recommendation is part of supporting your narrative. And most of all, you should shoot for a strong letter of recommendation. And so what does that mean? That means picking people who have relationships with you, that you are building on those relationships, not just because you've had them in class, but you continue to interact with them, that you engage in them, you go to their lectures, you're involved in clubs with them. Um, probably the most appropriate person that you should be looking for as one of your recommendations is that for your capstone experience, especially if that capstone is uh, you know, a building block of your future career interests. Uh, pick teachers in subjects that you excel in, that you've committed to, that you've put in the work in the class. 
um, not just ones that, that you happen to know. Uh, again, it's got to be uh, your best foot forward. And faculty that are consistent with your theme, as we talked about in the last video, if you're applying for a STEM major at a, you know, a technology focused institution, you probably don't want to only submit humanities or language or art faculty members. It's got to align with it. Um, again, make sure that recommenders have the content and context that they need. ASMSA students all develop a brag sheet, but this can be as simple as a, a resume. Um, I also recommend, if possible, to sit down and take time to actually talk through this with the person writing the recommendation. And here's why that's important for, for me especially. Um, I like to get students talking about uh, just all kinds of things about the application, about what they're interested in, why they're applying to the school, and then I like to pepper in random questions because when you get to the random questions that helps a student get off script, that helps them get off the core essays and the things they've already talked about. And when you get off script you get to the real you, to the actual things that you're interested in, the things that are important. And more often than not, I'd say 90 percent of the time, there's a throwaway statement, a little nugget of information that becomes so clear and real and authentic that that becomes the heart of my recommendation. And all the other things they've talked about are built on through that. But that one idea, that one idea becomes the, the heart and soul uh, of what I'm going to talk about in support of that, that student. And then finally, and it goes without saying, give sufficient plenty of time to write a quality letter. Do not wait until the day of, do not wait until the week of. Um, two weeks is the absolute minimum notice. And then I think one of the things that's helpful to ask faculty as you're working with them on recommendations is what kind of reminders and nudges do they need. Um, some will simply say, I'll get it done and I'll let you know. Um, me, personally, um, I remind students that I do not mind being reminded or nudged on it. Um, honestly, I don't mind being harassed even on have I submitted this thing because if I make that commitment to you that I'm going to write a letter, then I got to get it done. I have to make it happen. Um, but work, obligations, life intervenes, and so I never mind um, polite, professional nudges and follow-ups on it. So it's sometimes helpful to be clear and, and transparent in saying what kind of reminders can I offer, how will I know when this has been completed, and how can we work together on that. So keep those six things in mind on recommendations. Probably one of the other bits of trivia, minutia, however you want to look at it on uh, the selection process, is there is one factor that can actually greatly impact your ability of getting into a selective institution. And that's whether or not you decide to apply early decision. Now, there are two different ways to apply. Uh, one is simply early action. You are getting your application in early, and so it's part of the initial review process. Uh, the second form is binding early decision, in which you can only apply to one institution during that window, and if you are accepted to the institution, uh, then it's pretty clear that you are going to enroll and matriculate. Um, here's some numbers on why that is so important. The early bird does get the worm, and ultimately, your chance of getting in could be up to five times higher uh, by applying early, even if it is non-binding early admission. So with Harvard, um, again, the acceptance rate for early is about 15%. Dartmouth, especially as you're getting into 27 28%. Uh, Cornell in the mid-20s as well. Most of these are at least double, if not more. Uh, the chance of getting in. So uh, this is why starting to think about that list, um, developing it early, and then getting to work as soon as you return in August is incredibly important. For ISMSA students, this is also a little bit of a reminder that our student success coordinators were not always 12-month employees. They used to be 10-month employees. And one of the primary reasons we switched that model a few years ago was so that they could be available to help you in the summer. You know, that time when you're not juggling class and everything else, when you actually have a significant amount of time to dedicate to this process. 
And again, that becomes incredibly important now that so many college admissions and scholarship deadlines have shifted to November 1st. Georgia Tech and a couple of others lead the nation with October 15th deadlines. But honestly, that means you've got to go ahead and get it done. Uh, and one of the reasons that it's beneficial to be proactive in this process is that senior year is a different experience. New things are on the horizon. New courses, more challenging classes are, are coming at you. And, and this is a significant lift. It's also one of the reasons that we shifted Capstone a couple of years ago to primarily, if not exclusively, be completed in the junior year. That way, it's not another thing that's competing with this process, because it is important. It is part of your future, and we want to make sure you have the time to appropriately dedicate to it. In many respects, college applications themselves are an additional course should, and should be thought of as an additional course on top of the rest of your academic lift at ASMSA. So keep that in mind as you plan for the fall. There are two books I really like to share with folks and particularly parents when they say, I don't even know where to start in this process. And it's Getting In by Standing Out by, by Deborah Bador and then Greg Kaplan's Earning Admission. Um, and again, Kaplan's got a website, earningadmission.com. Uh, these books are about $10 to $15 on Amazon, so they're not super expensive. Um, and it reminds me, I need to follow up to make sure that we've got copies in the library at ASMSA. Uh, also, I think a, a quick uh, checklist from Earning Admission that, that's super helpful is when you're thinking about Earning Admission, here are eight fundamental concepts that you need to think intentionally about your college list, and that needs to be a list that is for you. We've talked a lot about completing a compelling theme and writing persuasive essays, that the courses that you pick are incredibly important, that you are intentionally focusing on the college exams, that you're engaged appropriately with extracurricular activities, uh, and again, how you are strategizing this entire process. Uh, while also thinking about this not as just um, boxes to check, uh, but as part of your own self-assessment in future planning. So feel free to check out earningadmission.com for more information. A couple other things to, to end on. This article uh, came across um, my screen over winter break this year. It's from Slate. Uh, it's got a pretty compelling headline. I killed my teenager's fancy college dreams. You should in part one, we talked about the average Arkansan who completes an undergraduate degree has about a $25,000 uh, debt that comes along with it. That's not insignificant. As you think about graduate school, as so many ASMSA students do, our alumni, about 20% of them go on to complete a doctoral degree, an MD, a JD, or some other terminal degree. And so that's additional schooling, that's additional debt, that's additional delayed time before your earning salary, benefits, retirement. And so when it's possible to minimize the amount of debt, um, there are some long-term benefits. But the reason I share this article in particular is it has to be an important part of the conversation that a student has with their family at the outset of the process. For some families, the most important thing, and for some students, the most important thing, will be getting into that dream school. For others, it's the biggest bang for their buck. So ASMSA graduates earn, uh, on average, about 50 hours of concurrent credit. They save about $14,000 in tuition. For some students, especially those with a very long tail on their learning, uh, going ahead and maximizing those opportunities may be important. But for others, it doesn't matter how much it costs, families are going to figure out the way for them to go to the school that they want to. And in reality, for most, think of it as a spectrum where these things are being determined in balance. And also, how does it all shake out at the end? Do I actually get into the institutions that, that I'm aspiring to? And if so, what does the financial aid package look like? There are a lot of decisions that have to be made um, before you settle on that school traditionally by May 1st. And the other thing I, I want to say on that is we can't make that decision for you. 
we can't do that. And and ultimately, for, for parents that may be watching this, please don't put us in the place of having to, to dash these dreams or ambitions. Um, we will always work toward the solution that is best and appropriate for a student, but we have to know what we're working with on it. So we're here to be your partner in this process. So utilize me, utilize our faculty, and especially our SSCs. Uh, and the reason, again, I, I always like to highlight um, our investment and the talent of our SA, SSCs. Uh, nationally, the number of college counselors to high school students is one for every 450, and the national recommendation on that is one counselor for every 250 students. So to have three academic and college advisors uh, plus one uh, mental health specialist for a population of uh, 230 students. Uh, that's intentional on our part because it's important to us and we want to make sure you've got the resources. So when the resources are there, use them to their fullest and they're happy to be part of your support network. Forget Harvard and Stanford. Doesn't really matter where you go to college. Much like the, the very talented young woman that I had the chance to work with, you're not looking for a particular institution or a name. You're looking for experiences, you're looking for the place you want to be, and you're looking for people. People who will invest in you and who will support you. Sometimes smaller programs, you know, more intimate environments, um, can be where where people have the time and opportunity to invest in you. It doesn't matter if you go to Cornell if you never see your research mentor. And by proxy, you can go to a, a public state school where from day one you have the chance to plug in and connect with faculty members. So don't think just exclusively on what's on the transcript, what's the name. Think of who it is that you'll be working with and where you ultimately want to be. So with that said, that completes our three-part series on finding a narrative and setting a path when it comes to college admissions. Do feel free to reach out to me with any questions by email or social media, and also continue to connect with ASMSA uh, as well. Hope you've enjoyed this series. Hope you've learned a little bit along the way, and good luck as you undertake this process, and I hope you make the decision that's right for you, your family, and for your future.